Mm, I'm really excited to be able to present you this, this uh, new product that we are working here as part of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. Uh, and what, I'm show, what I will show you here today is a new Sentinel-1 based fully automatic global flood monitoring product that we will integrate, as I said, in, as part of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. Now, before going into a bit of the technical details, let me show you a little bit um, what the Copernicus program is about, because um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure um, if, uh, if all of you know about this. Um, actually, do you, do you see the slides? I see that there is a message saying your screen sharing is paused. Um, Peter, we still see the uh, GFP presentation. Okay, wait a second, then let me stop sharing and I... Now you should, yes, true. Now you should be seeing, um, now you should be seeing the slide. Can you confirm, Sagi? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, we can see. Sorry. Okay, so yes, um, just, I was, I was just gonna say something about the um, Copernicus program. Copernicus is Europe's uh, earth observation program. And um, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about the Sentinel satellites, which are of course the key element uh, of, uh, of the Copernicus program, but there is more to the Copernicus program. Actually, um, there are also six services that have the aim to really use this Earth observation data, so the data from the Sentinel satellites, but also from in situ measurements, from models, to really provide an added value information and added value products uh, to users uh, downstream. Now, in the center of the slide, you see the six Copernicus services that currently exist. We have a land monitoring service, a marine, atmosphere, security service, climate change, and emergency management service. Now, I, I don't want to go into like details of what the services do. Have a look at uh, the Copernicus main webpage and you'll find out about it. But I'm going to show you a bit more about the emergency management service because this is where this new product will be integrated. The emergency management services has basically two big building blocks. Uh, one is on-demand mapping, so users can activate uh, the service. And then you have, for example, you can get rapid maps uh, on any disaster uh, around the world, um, really 24-7. So the aim is really on fast provision of this kind of information. And the second component here is, is a risk and recovery mapping, uh, also here on demand, activated by users. and uh, this is really looking at prevention and planning uh, for disasters. Uh, so uh, let's say satellite derived exposure information or satellite derived risk maps of a certain hazard. Now the second building block of the emergency management service is the early warning and monitoring system. So these are here we've, we've added, let's say systems that continuously monitor and forecast um, for the three most prominent hazards uh, in, in Europe, but also globally, and that is forest fires, floods, and uh, droughts. Uh, and here you see on the right-hand side, you see examples, the, for example, the European forest fire information system or the European and global flood awareness system. So this is a bit the setup of the EMS. Now, um, when talking about this new global flood monitoring product, I'm sure most of you know the image uh, that I've taken here from CRED uh, on top, um, which shows that floods are the most frequent disaster, natural, natural hazard occurring uh, worldwide. And, and you also, I don't need to tell you that this has obviously also huge in economic in, uh, consequences as well as a number of a large number of affected people. So there's clear need for further uh, information and data on in order to better manage flood risk and to reduce the impacts of floods, uh, which is why we, we started uh, thinking and setting up this new global, uh, this global flood monitoring product. But before doing that, we went around and, and looked at what are actually the user's needs. And I've, on the bottom of the slide, I, I have here a couple or the most prominent ones. Obviously the first uh, and foremost is that the information that you would get out of a flood monitoring product needs to be uh, there in a time, timely manner. Meaning um, it is useless if you get a flood extent map 
for emergency response if, uh, if it's already three, four, five days old, but you need it as fast as possible. Now, another user requirement is obviously frequent updates and continuous monitoring. A lot of users have asked us and said, well, you know, we need to adapt the measures depending on how the situation of the flood evolves. So we need to have a continuous update uh, of, of this kind of flood monitoring. So it's not enough if you provide one map, um, we need a continuous updating. Now, the third point, and this is something which probably most of you is familiar, is spatial resolution. Now, obviously, users always want the highest spatial resolution that they can get, but most of them are also well aware that it's always a compromise that has to be made between what is technically feasible and what is uh, really required to do the work they need to do. So really uh, here also to, to be able to do a, a planning, a response, an impact assessment, uh, and they do acknowledge the fact that, of course, um, we cannot do this at, at a centimeter or a meter, a very low range meter scale, especially when we're talking about global products. Um, but for them, it's really important. The basic is that the resol resolution is enough uh, to, to uh, do the prevention planning or the, the, res the rapid response. Now, there's two more items on user requirements, and this is uh, being able to access historic data. This is especially important for prevention planning. So uh, if you want to look at past flood events, and then the access should be as diverse as possible to account for all user needs. So we really need to look at, at providing an access that is going from, let's say, as an easy thing is ready to print maps, right? That is somebody just needs to take and, and, and print out and be in the field and, and reply to say, okay, we need to send uh, uh, maybe uh, sandbags here or, or do uh, get rescue people there. Um, to really as well to the, let's say, to the scientist, the researcher that really wants to get down to the detail of the data and maybe do some spatial analysis. So the access needs to be really diverse. Now, having that in mind, um, we designed uh, this new global flood monitoring product. And, and on this slide, you see here the key features of it. So what we are doing, I mean, obviously being Copernicus, we are using uh, the Sentinel-1 uh, information. Now, um, I don't need to tell you that synthetic aperture radar uh, obviously enables us to do really, is, is ideally suited for flood monitoring because it's all day and, and all weather. Um, has its all day and all weather capacity. So we are independent of clouds, we're independent of daylight. It provides a, a reasonable, a good spatial resolution. Um, our product will be of 20 meter at a global level. So um, here you see that some of the products sometimes of Sentinel-1 are 10 meter, but we reduce this we, a little bit in order to uh, remove background noise better um, and also to have uh, less less storage uh, requirements, as you can imagine. Otherwise, this gets really big at a global level. Um, then we have a very high revisit frequency. And in fact, you probably all know that Sentinel-1 is actually a two satellite uh, constellation. So currently, Sentinel-1A and B. Uh, in a couple of years, they will add a third one, Sentinel-1C. So these times that I'm mentioning here will actually increase. The revisit frequency will even increase further. So going from one to three days in Europe um, and, and for the rest of those roughly three to 14 days. Uh, the second element is that the product is going to be fully automatic, um, meaning that we process fully automatic and continuously all incoming Sentinel-1 images. And this enables us to really have a really high, uh, to ensure and, and guarantee a really high timeliness. So, we, have, we are trying to look at more than 90% of the incoming Sentinel images to process them and, and deliver them as a product in less than eight hours between the sensing of the actual image and the product delivery. Um, this is really uh, something that, that we try to push as far as possible as, you, as you've seen in the previous slide because timeliness is really a key required user requirement. And as I said, I mean, this is going to be done in a fully automatic and continuous manner for all Sentinel-1 images. So really, we are able to provide a continuous monitoring worldwide uh, on floods using this new product. Now, let's 
get into the, the core and the, into the heart of, of how we do the flood delineation. And what we did is we, are, we will apply not a single uh, algorithm, but we will make use of an ensemble uh, approach. So what we are going to uh, use is the three algorithms that um, I listed here. Many of you probably know them already. Um, the first one is, is a development by the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, we'll hear afterwards from Marco uh, as well on, on new developments there. But in this case here, it's still the it's based on a hierarchical split-based approach on a on a recent pair of of, uh, of Sentinel One images. Then the second algorithm is developed by the German Aerospace Center, um, and it's a fuzzy logic-based approach. And the last one that we are going to use is a um, uh, algorithm developed by the University of Vienna. And this really looks at uh, exploiting the Sentinel-1 uh, history uh, in a data cube. So really trying to develop a backscatter probability distribution for each and every pixel in the model and pre-compute global parameters to, to then come up with a fast way of delineating um, uh, flooded areas. So um, what obviously we, we chose these, uh, the, uh, these three um, algorithms in order to be able to uh, make use of all of the three advantages that they present. We all know, and we'll probably hear about it later, as well, there's many more algorithms. Uh, all of them have advantages or disadvantages, uh, but uh, clearly for us, uh, choosing those three, um, um, which have been used a lot in, in, uh, in, in even operational situations, uh, will, will provide us the advantage that we are able to provide high quality products in, in many of the geographical settings that uh, you will encounter when you do a global processing of, or, or a processing of, of geographical areas around the globe. And as I said, also one of the key requirements, uh, and this is also very important because we are trying to do this in a fully automatic and continuous way, is that all three algorithms have a very high maturity in when it comes to operationalizing them. Um, so this is obviously also something which uh, when you do a look at a lot of machine learning algorithms or, or uh, using the INSAR coherence, these are really interesting approaches. But um, when, when looking at, uh, at implementing them in a fully operational environment, uh, they, I think they still need to do some further, uh, there is some further development and work needed. Now, um, just to show you a few examples um, of this uh, preliminary examples, obviously we'll have the observed flood extent that is, uh, not, doesn't come as a surprise. Um, what we also provide is obviously as well the reference water mass, but uh, also this is not a surprise, but here we will use a permanent as well as a seasonal water mass. We all know that um, uh, water uh, areas can be flooded or inundated, I should call it, uh, due to the hydrological cycle, and, and those are actually not considered to be flooded in the sense that damaging floods, but this is the usual seasonal coverage with water. So here again, we have uh, both permanent and seasonal in, in this new product, and it will be based, both of them will be based on historical Sentinel-1 time series data. So they will be completely consistent with the product generated in near real time. Um, as I said um, before, we use an ensemble of, of algorithms and, and methods, and, and hence we also provide the uncertainty of those. And this is what you see on the bottom of the slide. Um, this is really important information. As I said, none of the algorithms is perfect, um, and we need to inform the users where, um, um, let's say, there is a higher uncertainty of whether the actual pixel that we show is flooded or not flooded. Uh, how, how, how high the uncertainty is there in that, um, uh, in that pixel well uh, on, uh, related to, um, to the flood delineation. Now, um, we all know also that uh, synthetic aperture radar has some limitations, generic limitations, so we will have uh, information also on uh, an exclusion layers, basically looking at urban, uh, but also dense vegetation, radar shadows, um, where the algorithm or none of the algorithms actually can provide uh, any information. And there will be also advisory flags because sometimes we also know snow, ice or very dry soil or strong wind conditions can influence the quality um, of uh, the flood maps. So really trying to present the user 
uh, with a full detail if he wants on um, to to work with uh, with the date with this data. Um, last but not least, um, we also try to have a first estimate of the impact information. Um, so we'll cross the data automatically also with land use and then population data. Here we use the global human settlements layer. And uh, we provide also the user some metadata information on, on Sentinel-1, obviously on the acquisition parameters, but most importantly, also when the next image for this area is going to be acquired so that he knows that uh, he will get then an update uh, soon. Now, um, just as a last slide, um, product access as many of the, as all of the Copernicus pro products is free and open. Um, as I said, we want to have a diverse access. So the easiest one will be using basically our web interfaces uh, for our flood forecasting systems in the European and global flood awareness system. There will be also uh, OGC compliant web services and ready to print maps. And then who really wants to work with the data uh, can have access to the data through an advanced programming interface. Now we are starting work on this, basically the, the real implementation plan for CIS to do this now, to start uh, in, in, in the coming weeks, basically. And uh, hopefully by next year's summer, um, we'll be able to, uh, to go fully operational. And then I'll be able to hopefully also in the next uh, GFP meeting show you uh, some uh, real time uh, operational results. Uh, last but not least, on the right-hand side, you see that we are not doing this by ourselves. This is done uh, in collaboration with all the, the, the uh, companies and, and enterprises you've seen here on the right. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, I, I finish my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Um, please post questions in the chat. And then um, I suppose at the end uh, of all the presentations, um, we are, I have the chance to maybe answer a few of those. With that, I'll uh, give back to Saki and to Albert. Thank you, Peter.